Hey, it's Brett, and this is Brett and Some Books. Today we're continuing The Plot to Seize the White House by Jules Archer. This is chapter 9 of part 2. The Marine Corps promoted Butler to Lieutenant Colonel in August 1916. Winning commendation as a capable administrator, he kept Haiti stable and at peace for the first time in half a century. He grew fond of Tikhonov, while acknowledging, I knew he was an old political crook. Typical, the president's expenditures from the treasury was $1,600, quote, to have a hole in the carpet mended, end quote. Traveling all over Haiti without a gun, despite the cacos, Butler established a postal service, a country school system, a network of telegraph lines, a civil hospital in Port au Prince, and a 500 mile road system. He also restored lighthouses and channel buoys. Although these civic and economic improvements unquestionably benefited American investors, Butler's primary purpose was to improve life for the Haitians. I was and have been ever since very fond of the Haitian people, he wrote later. And it was my ambition to make Haiti a first-class black man's country. But no amount of Butler's good works could erase from Haitian minds the humiliating awareness that they had been robbed of their independence by military occupation. Haitians had no shortage of legitimate grievances. The supreme power on the island was not Butler, who was preoccupied with the gendarmerie, but with the commanding officer of the Marines in Haiti, Littleton Waller, who was made a brigadier general in the fall of 1916, as the officer who had once been court-martialed for brutality toward Filipino natives, he did not inspire among his staff officers any vast respect for Haitian sensibilities. In the interior, they talked as casually of shooting, quote, Gooks as sportsmen start sport sportsmen talked of duck hunting, patrolling against the cacos. Some marine officers looted the homes of native families they were supposed to protect. Others talked of cleaning out the island by killing out the entire native population. Prisoners were beaten and tortured to make them tell what they knew about cacos' whereabouts. Some were forced to quote escape and then shot as they fled. Haitians in the interior were forced to carry bon habitant, good citizen passes. Any native stopped by a marine and unable to produce a bon habitant could either be shot or arrested. Understandably, many Haitians became convinced that all Americans were racial bigots who hated black men and behind the Americans in uniform were the American businessmen who plundered the wealth of the island with impunity. Butler, now in his early thirties, did not take Haitian politicians very seriously. He viewed most of them as banana republic opportunists, not too different from the crooked ward bosses who infested the American body politic. The ingenuity and pretensions of the shrewdest, like Bertrand Guinav, tickled his sense of humor, but he regarded the Haitian people themselves with respect and affection, if blind to the irony implicit in the presumption to offer superior government, government to a black republic by a nation that had signally failed to solve its own serious race problem. His eyes increasingly, however, opened to the fact that he was being used by big business interests to pacify the population in order to protect profitable American investments. The Haitian government, such as it is, either yields perforce to American pressure, reported correspondent Her Herbert J. Seligman in The Nation, or finds itself in feeble and ineffectual opposition. The present government of Haiti, which dangles wires from pull pulled by American fingers, would not endure for 24 hours if the United States Armed Forces were withdrawn and the President, Dartigwinov, would face death or exile. Butler protested to Washington about some of the injustices of the occupation. 
and on October 9, 1916, he wrote to the State Department to point out that the Haitians logically objected to the retention of Marine officers in the Gendarmerie unless they were made subject to trial by Haitian courts. Since otherwise, the United States could mount a coup d'etat whenever it chose to order one, his protest fell on deaf ears. By the spring of 1916, Haitian discontent was growing rapidly. Waller warned Butler to be on guard because Kakos, spreading the rumor that Americans would soon pull out, were urging people to rise and destroy them now. Butler felt deeply discouraged. Despite everything he had tried to do for the people, the dollar sign behind the occupation had made all his efforts useless. In July, he wrote to Lejeune, all of us gendarmes are mighty tired, and I, for one, am going to ask to be relieved at the first opportunity presenting itself. In August, Waller ordered him into Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic, sharing the island with Haiti to put down a revolt led by Salidiano Pantillon to stabilize the economy. The Dominican Republic government had defaulted its obligations to American banks and paid for its sins with an American occupation to protect U.S. investments that lasted eight years. When he returned from Santo Domingo, mission accomplished, a letter was waiting for him from Lejeune. Assist Assistant Secretary Roosevelt came back with glowing accounts of the splendid work being done by the Marine Corps in connection with the Gendarmerie. Lejeune wrote enthusiastically, You certainly deserve the greatest credit for what you have done in making the soldier out of the ignorant Haitian. But Butler had begun to brood about the virtue of leading American boys into battle, causing some to lose their lives and others to suffer permanent disablement to protect American business interests in the Caribbean. He grew quietly cynical about some of the compliments paid to him. In neighboring Santo Domingo, revolutionists joined bandits in shaking down American plantation managers for money. Repulsed, they set cane fires and sought to prevent cane from being cut and ground. The American sugar interest there wanted Butler to come to their rescue once again. Members of the Sugar Association and myself, their associates, their spokesman, businessman Frank H. Vetter, wrote to Roosevelt, desire to express to you our appreciation of the improvement of conditions, the hard work being done by the Marines in the field. The dangers from bandit operations are by no means past or remote. Additional troops would be of great assistance in clearing up the situation. To Butler's relief, Roosevelt replied, I appreciate, of course, that the complete elimination of bandit operations is at the present time exceedingly difficult, but I trust that the acting military governor will be able to give all the protection necessary with the forces under his command. Butler sought to convince the State Department that the Haitians would never cease to be anti-American until Washington allowed them to hold honest elections and choose their own president. Spies tipped off Dartena Gunav who grew chilly toward Butler, putting his job in jeopardy. But Haiti received little attention now from the State Department, which was carefully studying developments in World War I. Reading about the war from his remote outpost, Butler regarded it with loathing as madness, a European bloodbath. He fervently hoped that Wilson would have the good sense to keep American boys out of it. When the president took America into the war, however, Butler instantly appealed to Lejeune to be for a combat assignment in France, where he felt he would at least be serving his country instead of Wall Street. Lejeune replied that the State Department was so pleased with his work as an administrator in Haiti that it had refused to transfer him to the European war front. Unappeased, Butler beamed Butler moaned to Lejeune in June 1917, The service is becoming more and more detestable every day, and the knowledge that I am not allowed to fight for my country makes it even more unbearable. He appealed to Roosevelt, Secretary Roosevelt, 
and I, replied John McElhinney of the U.S. Civil Service Commission, are of the same opinion that the work which you have, hand, have in hand should not be interfered with or disturbed because it is the most potent factor in maintaining a peaceful occupation. An entreaty to his father also failed to work. Your father, wrote Representative W. L. Hensley of the House Naval Affairs Committee, has gone into all these matters with the Secretary of War concerning your ambitions. They feel you are doing a great work where you are, and for you to be transferred from there would turn things topsy-turvy. Disconsolate, Butler threw himself into a new orgy of road building. In 45 days, he built the new road from Port au Prince to Cape Haitian, across, one, across 21 miles of the roughest, densest tropical country he had ever seen. After he had driven the first car over it, Secretary of State Lansing cabled congratulations. McIlhenny wrote him, I think your achievement in building a road from Port au Prince to Cape Haitian in such a time and at such a cost is a miracle. Someone has misled you, he replied impatiently, concerning my value to this country and the aims of the U.S. down here, for I am simply a subordinate to the chief of the American occupation and have no independent authority. By now, Butler was strongly suspicious that he was being held in Haiti by the War Department's lack of confidence in his fitness for command in France. When he asked a friend in Washington to snoop and investigate for him, he was, insured, he was assured that his suspicions were unfounded. The government was really having trouble finding a competent man to replace him. He still didn't believe it. His instincts told him that his old enemies in the Navy Department were working against him. He had trodden on a good many other important toes as well during his two years in Haiti, and he had heard rumors spread by some naval officers that he had won all his medals and promotions because of his father's influence. He did not hesitate to try to use that influence when Thomas Butler became chairman of the House Naval Affairs Committee in 1918. But his renewed pleas to be allowed to serve in the AEF failed to move his father and he remained bogged down disconsolately in Haiti. He grew increasingly unhappy with the government's management of the island's affairs. Under wartime censorship, Port au Prince's newspapers were suppressed and their editors jailed for suggesting that since Mr. Wilson was so concerned about the fate of poor little nations overrun by military aggressors that he had gone to war in Europe for them, he might consider rescuing little Haiti from its invaders. Some years later, when Harding succeeded Wilson in the White House, Artigunov called upon him to remove all Marines from Haiti and liberate the Haitian people. To dramatize his case, Artigunov accused Butler of having dissolved the Haitian National Assembly by force of arms without authority, conveniently ignoring the fact that he had begged Butler to do it, and that he had written him upon his departure, I regret to see you obliged to cease your services in this country, and I was well pleased with the broad and intelligent cooperation that you have constantly given the government. Artigonov's memorial to Harding, published widely in the United States, stirred up a hell of a commotion, as Butler put it. The Senate appointed an investigating committee with Senator Medill McCormick of Illinois as chairman. Butler was summoned as a witness. A lawyer for the American NAACP demanded to know on what authority he had presumed to dissolve the Haitian National Assembly. The president, Dartigwanov, himself dissolved the Congress, Butler replied. I merely carried his decree of dissolution to the assembly. Haitian witnesses jeered at this assertion but their faces fell when Butler produced the decree signed by Dr. Guinav and his cabinet. It had been prudently saved among Butler's memorabilia. The upset Haitian politicians denounced it as a forgery, but were compelled to acknowledge it as authentic when it was compared with other documents signed by Dr. Guinav. His case won, 
Butler saw no need to embarrass the State Department by revealing that Secretary of State Robert Lansing had secretly ordered any steps necessary to stop the National Assembly from passing an anti-American constitution. Soon afterward, Secretary of the Navy Edwin Denby asked Butler to return to Haiti as High Commissioner with a, quote, civilian financial advisor, end quote, who Butler knew would represent American big business investors and dictate economic policy. He had had enough of letting Wall Street profiteers use the Marines as their private army. He would prefer not to go, he told Danby, and certainly not with any civilian financial advisor. In that case, Danby said coldly, he need not go at all. In March 18, 1918, Bursting with frustration over his inability to get into the action on France's battlefield, Butler decided to press the matter personally with Lejeune, who was now a general during medical leave to Washington for dentistry.